Hello, hello there. Welcome to our COP online evening service. So good we get to be together tonight. And as always, we start with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And everybody said, Amen. For our praise moment today, we are going back to 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 4. We are learning what it means to be a minister, to be ministry involved, to have a ministry where we are serving God, waiting on God, attending to God, amen, worshiping him, all these things that the word minister means. And it says in this verse, 1 Chronicles 16, 4, then he appointed some of the Levites to minister or as ministers before the ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. The first one of those responsibilities, it says, is the word invoke. Invoke. It's a Hebrew word, zakar, and it means to remember or to recall information or events with a focus on responding in an appropriate manner. That's the definition. So it's most often translated, this word is most often translated as remember, remembrance, mention, record or recorder, bring to remembrance, recall. You get the idea. If you have an invocation at your graduation event, what are you doing? You're calling upon God to be with you in your event, right? You are invoking the name of God with the idea that he will be there and he will bless you. In the instructions in 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 4, ministers or ministry-involved people, go-group leaders, ushers, choir members, are to invoke the Lord, the God of Israel. Well, now that is a joy. <laughs> Talk about, well, that's my responsibility to invoke. Yes, but you are to invoke, call to remembrance, call to mind, remember, record, cause people to remember the Lord, the God of Israel. Oh, let's see the first time the Lord, the God of Israel, that phrase is used in scripture. Exodus chapter 5 verse 1. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may worship me, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Let my people go. Let, that is the, wow, 
powerful pronouncement by the Lord, the God of Israel. All right. So those of us who are to minister by invoking, we invoke, what do we invoke? The Lord, the God of Israel. So you're a go group leader and you are to invoke the Lord, the God of Israel to your members. What is it that you have to do? You cause to be remembered. Who is this Lord, the God of Israel? Well, as far as your members are concerned, you teach them. He is the one who said to Pharaoh, let my people go out of slavery, out of sin. Let them come up out of the land of slavery, that the Lord God could lead them into their destiny, into all the promises that he had for them, that hope and a future, that wonderful promised land that will be their inheritance. So when we stand to minister in the house of God, or in our go group, or when we're doing anything, we're, we're bringing groceries to an unfortunate member who is in need. Whatever we're doing in the name of the Lord to minister, we invoke the Lord, the God of Israel. We don't stand there thinking how great we sound. We don't stand there thinking we look beautiful and full of dignity in our new clothes. We don't even think about it. We are there to invoke the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, who is there among the people to set them free, to bring them into their destiny, to loose them from bondage and let the chains fall off. He has plans to prosper them, and give them hope and a future. This is what we are doing when we stand to minister. All right. Let's see another verse where this same word is used, where they are invoking the Lord, the God of Israel. In Exodus 24, verse 10, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. Wow crystal clear sapphire, sapphire stone before him. And there he was. And there they were. This is when the leaders, the elders of Israel had gotten together. And they saw the Lord, the God of Israel. Wow. Eating in his presence, talking with him. Is that not mind blowing? But the next time we stand to minister the next time we get on that Zoom meeting with our Go group and we are ministering to our members, we are ministering to the Lord and we are invoking the Lord, the God of Israel. We need to have eyes that see him, eyes that see what he's doing, what he sees, what he feels. We need to be that person that sees the chariots of fire all around us. We need to be that person that sees the captain of the Lord's hosts standing before our members saying, I will lead you into victory in your lives. These are the things we need to invoke, call to remembrance, cause to be remembered. And it's, of course, you can go on and on through the scriptures, through the exploits of Joshua and Caleb, Moses, and all the great men and women of God. The Bible is full of examples as we invoke the Lord, the God of Israel. We will call to mind all of those examples, and we will be encouraged, and we will encourage our members. We're understanding more of what being ministry involved is. Having a ministry, we are to invoke the Lord, the God of Israel. Amen. Right now, we're going to stand together because it's our opportunity to worship. If you can stand, stand and open your heart and lift your hands and let's worship our wonderful God together. Amen. Oh, yeah. 
As we turn our attention tonight to the book of Romans, we're going to deal with a subject that, forgive me, is a little ouchy, okay? It's it's one of those subjects that when you begin to talk about it, everybody just kind of bows their head a little bit and goes, oh my, we're going to talk about debt. Now, talking about debt in the middle of a COVID-19 crisis is especially ouchy, okay? I mean, we, we want to go, oh, Pastor Arai. I understand, but we need to teach 
all the Bible. All right, that's the beautiful thing about expository preaching is you have to deal with all the verses, the ones that are fun and the ones that are ouchy. Now, look in Romans 13, beginning with verse 8 tonight. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Now Paul begins this beautiful passage by dealing with one of the most practical and one of the most difficult areas of our life. The concept of debt. Now, I know after, what, 15, 15 months of COVID lockdowns now, and it was just announced uh, last night that we're going to have um, two more weeks of MECQ, and you just kind of go, oh, <laughs> you just kind of went, oh, you could, you could hear the groan coming out across the city. But folks, this will end well with us. And please, beloved, you know, I've been watching some of the stuff in India, praying for the people of India. And you see the thousands of funeral pyres. I mean, basically bonfires with the body inside, looking like something out of the medieval ages. Thousands of people where they just put a body in the middle of wood and, and cremate it. You just... I can't even imagine the suffering happening in India right now. And we don't want that to happen here in our own beloved nation. Amen. So, yes, we bow our heads and we groan, but let's not complain. Okay. Things are getting back under control. But talking about debt in this season is a difficult time. We recognize that the goal of God is for his people to live debt free. Deuteronomy 15 verse 6. For the Lord your God will bless you as he has promised. And you will lend to many nations, but borrow from none. You will rule over many nations, but none will rule over you. Deuteronomy 28, verse 12, the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. So there's, God will bring prosperity to you. You will lend to many nations, but borrow from none. Now notice, this debt-free living comes as a result of God's blessing upon your life. It comes because God sends the rain on the land and the season. It comes because God blesses the work of our hands. This debt-free living is the abundant life. This debt-free living is prosperity. Now, now the reason I, I interject that in there is that there are people that teach prosperity more like I would teach greed and avarice, okay? I mean, they... They think that a prosperous lifestyle is, is a consumption lifestyle where, you know, you're, you're in debt. Like I looked at this one guy and he, he owed $500,000 on that and a million dollars on this. And this was all his personal debt. And, you know, he looked very wealthy, but in actuality, I was richer than he was because I had no debt and he owed a million and a half dollars. So maybe my car was old and secondhand, but I was debt free. Now to me, I'm prosperous and he's not. Okay, in my simple mind, prosperity is not having a bunch of stuff that you're in debt for. Prosperity is God has blessed the work of my hands and because of the blessings on the work of my hands, I, I lend to many and borrow from none. I'm, I'm debt free. There's no pressure. Now, beloved, that's a beautiful, beautiful way to live. And you have to understand there are people who, like I've had people walk up to me and people that I knew fairly well. David, I thought you believed in prosperity. I do. Then why are you driving that old car? It's paid for. You know, I just sold one of our vans because it had over 100,000 kilometers on it. Why do you keep a car that long? Well, because it was still running good. When it started to get its squeaks and rattles and stuff and I needed the money for something else, I'll sell it. Folks, you have to understand Prosperity is not measured by the abundance of stuff that you have in debt for. Prosperity is an abundant lifestyle. God has blessed the work of your hands and you lend to many and, and borrow from none. That is a prosperous lifestyle. Now, 
that said, there are times when we do need to borrow money, when we have need. Exodus chapter 22, verse 25. If you lend money to any one of my people among you who is needy, do not be like a money lender, charge him no interest. Now, there are people who distort this verse and say that, you know, the banks are sinning because they're charging interest. Well, if you're borrowing money to do business, that's different. That's not borrowing money because you have a need. So when, when people have a need, God says, okay, you can borrow money. But it, that's not what God wants for us. God wants us to live a debt-free life. Now, I want to go very slowly, and I might go a little long tonight, so I'll, I'll ask forgiveness in advance. I want to talk to you about principles of debt, and I want to talk to you about how to stay current with your debt or how to pay your debt. Now, let's start with principles. First of all, it is not a sin to be in debt. Romans 13, verse 8 says, Let no debt remain outstanding. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. In other words, keep everything current. Now, in this world that we live in today, forgive me, we all go into debt multiple times every day. I mean, if you go into a nice restaurant, now not McDo or Kentucky Fried or something, but if you go into a nice restaurant where you're going to sit down and eat, you know what? You're going to eat your food before you pay for the meal. So you are in debt to that restaurant. You, you just were in debt. If you, you go to the gas station and fill up your car with gas, they, they fill up your gas tank and then they give you the bill. You are now in debt and you have to pay the debt. They, they put gas in your car and now you have to pay for it. So you are in debt. Morelco bills you at the end of the month for what you have consumed. That is a debt. For most of our, our phone payments, especially the postpaid, you know, they send you the bill at the end of the month you're on the 299 plan or, or 2999 plan or whatever it is or the 699 plan well at the end of the month you get a bill now you've used it all month but now you have a debt so it, in this world of, that we live in debt is a normal part of life so the trick is let no debt remain outstanding in other words stay current with your debt it's almost impossible to buy a car, a new car at least, or buy a house or buy a condo without going to the bank and borrowing money. But again, the trick is you keep the debt current. Let no debt remain outstanding. As a debt is due, you pay it. Let no debt remain outstanding. As the debt is due, you pay it. Now, I want you to notice some simple thoughts here, and this is going to offend some of you a little bit. Jesus borrowed. Yeah, he, he borrowed a room for the uh, Last Supper. In Mark 14, verses 13 to 15, we find the story. He, he borrowed a room. Okay, it was not his room. He borrowed something. In Matthew 21, verses 1 to 3, we just talked about it during Holy Week. He borrowed a donkey. He, he borrowed something from somebody. In Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 3, he borrowed Peter's boat. So, so Jesus borrowed things. When, when he had a need, he, he borrowed something, but he let no debt remain outstanding. Do you remember one of the beautiful truths we taught you about the donkey was the master will return it shortly. And what we taught you about the, the boat, then he took Peter out into the deep and Peter had the biggest catch of fish he'd ever had in his life. So the, the, the thing is, it's not a sin to borrow money. What is a sin is not to pay the debt. Let no debt remain outstanding. A prophet of God borrowed money. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And I'll read you the rest of the story later. But notice... Here was a prophet of God who had borrowed money. Okay, he had, he had borrowed. Jesus also teaches us to lend. Matthew 5, verse 42. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. So if it is a sin to borrow, why would Jesus tell us to lend? Ah, Luke 6, verse 35. Love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Okay, why, if borrowing is a sin, why would Jesus teach us to lend? 
Ah, okay. So we, we have to get rid of some of the super spirituality that has been preached out there and get down to the practical, real world of you're not going to be able to live in this world without debt. Now, I looked at a uh, young pastor one day, and he was saying, oh, Pastor Summerall, my church is debt-free. And I looked at him, and I said, young man, no, it's not. He said, oh, we're debt-free, Pastor. I said, no, it's not. I said, you are renting a building for your auditorium. Is that correct? Yes, Pastor. I said, renting a building is the cruelest form of debt because it never goes away. You never get it paid off. And it keeps increasing. They keep giving you like a 1% or a 3% increase every year, two years, or three years. I said, that's the cruelest form of debt. Your payments only get bigger and they never end. Wow. Yes, and now you're beginning to understand. You have to, under, you have to come to a better understanding of what debt is before you can understand what it means to owe, to keep up, let no debt remain outstanding. Now, what is a sin is to not pay your debt. Romans 13, verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding. Psalms 37, verse 21, the wicked borrow and do not repay. The wicked borrow and do not repay. Now, you know, forgive me, but right now you may have a hard time paying your debts. But as you have money, you need to always make sure you don't forget. Halingbawa. Many, many years ago, during the 90s and all the hard days, and we were trying to finish the building, we had an American company come in, I think they were called CCI, something like that, to do the PA system of our church. Well, we went through another economic thing. We went through another devaluation. We went through whatever, and we couldn't make the final payments. We owed them a little over 90000 U.S. dollars. Well, under the U.S. law, after three years of on payment, they had the right that that debt off and just consider it's gone. Well, after a few years after that, we were, had everything turned around. We called them on the phone and we said, now, now listen, we, we owe you some money. And the guy was crying on the phone because he was broke at that time. They were going through an economic crisis where he lived and he was completely broke and had nothing to even pay his salaries. And we sent him a check for $91,000 or something like that, some amount right around that and completely paid it off because now we had the money. Now, we could have said, well, you know, it's already written off in their books under U.S. law. We don't have to pay it. Hallelujah. God canceled our debt. No, God didn't cancel the debt. The government made the guy take it off his books, but we still owed the money. So we paid the debt. Now, at some point, you have to understand the wicked borrow and do not repay. A righteous person, we may be slow in paying. We may have problems right now, but we have to make up our mind that we're honest people and honest people always pay their debts. Amen. Now, some things to consider before you enter into debt, and we're going very slow through this. The first thing that you have to consider is not how much can I, how much can I borrow? It should be, what can I pay? Never, how much is the limit? How much can I have? It's how much can I pay? The ability to pay should be the determination of what you borrow, not how, how much your name can get, okay? See, when you enter into a debt, other people have a voice in your finances, and you're, you're going to have to understand this. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7. The rich rule over the poor. And the borrower is servant to the lender. Now, you may not like that, but the borrower is servant to the lender. When, when you owe somebody money, they have a right to talk to you about your finances. Every businessman will tell you that when they borrow money from a bank, the bank has certain conditions that have to be maintained in the company. And if those covenants are violated, then the loan is can do and, and the loan is called due and you know, you, you're in violation of contract. There are, are covenants that they have of things that have to be done. Everybody who borrows needs to understand the person who loaned the money has a right to talk about their finances. If you borrow 10,000 pesos from your auntie and then your auntie sees you buying a new cell phone and you haven't paid her back yet, 
she has a right to say something because the borrower is servant to the lender. So if you want people to keep their nose out of your money, keep their money out of your pocket. Okay, let me say that again. If you want people to keep their nose out of your money, it's none of their business, then keep their money out of your pocket. Until then, the borrower is servant to the lender. They have a right to speak. Another principle I want you to see, when you enter debt, you have to understand it is the unexpected that causes you trouble. Do you remember our passage we read just a minute ago about the, the prophet, 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 to 7? The prophet entered into debt. He was still a fairly young man. He had a wife and he had a young son or a couple of young sons, but then he died suddenly and he left his family in trouble. When you borrow money, remember, it's not how much can I borrow, it's how much can I pay and then add to that. These people are going to have a right to speak about my finances and then add to that, I have to be careful of the unexpected. Now, a, a young man asked me the other day, Pastor Summerall, do you have any regrets in life and ministry? I said, yes. He said, what? I said, going heavily into debt back in the 80s when we first started building this building. Because the unexpected made our life impossible. I mean, the pace of devaluations, the rampant inflation, the, the, the decrease in earning power of the people during that time, it was, it was horribly difficult. Now, I had sat down and made all kinds of things in my feasibility studies, but I had no experience to be able to predict inflation. Well, I didn't take in, into account inflation. I had no ability to understand uh, pace of devaluation. I had no ability to understand interest rates at 50%. I had no ability to comprehend e economic crisis as the scale that we had. So if you, if you look at me now, you'll find I'm really conservative about borrowing money because and, and owing money to anybody because I've been through the unexpected. And young people, you'll find your parents are the same way. When you've been in a situation and you can't pay your bills because the unexpected crippled you one more time. So you have to understand when you borrow money, it's not how much can I get? It's how much can I pay? Understanding they're going to have a voice in my finances and understanding what about the unexpected? Where are the oopses in life? Now, let me give you a third principle. You should never borrow on the basis of speculation. Now, you got to have to understand, I was raised in a business family. I was raised learning how to make feasibility studies. My background is accounting finance. You know, I can make a business plan. I can make a feasibility, a 10-year feasibility study. I, I mean, please, I'm really good at all that stuff. I, I did it when it was still all on paper before we had computers and we could just, you know, punch in a few things and everything would just come out. We had to do it line by line. But you know what I learned about feasibility studies? It's all speculation. You're all hoping to achieve these targets. You're hoping to achieve these goals. But Proverbs 27 verse 1 says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. You don't know what a day may bring forth. Now, I look back at the 80s and 90s and go, look at the grace of God upon the Cathedral of Praise. Okay? Because somehow in the middle of all that chaos, we survived. But we learned lessons in those days, and now we understand. We don't know tomorrow. We, we, we will not boast about tomorrow. We don't know what tomorrow brings. You see, wealth always transfers in the hard times. And one of the reasons for it is people borrow money on speculation. There are people that were speculating on the, um, the, the, the pogos, and they were speculating on real estate prices and condos and rental prices in condos. And they went out and borrowed lots of money and bought a whole bunch of condos and rented them at a big price. And then the pogos left town. And now banks are foreclosing. People borrowed money for cars and then lost their jobs. Th these are very difficult days. So borrowing money on the basis of what you hope will happen. Please, I've been there, done that, okay? Spent years cleaning up the mess. But for the grace of God, we would have been destroyed. 
So you, you, you learn these lessons in blood and you never borrow money on the basis of speculation. James chapter 4, beginning with verse 13, says, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow will go to this city or that, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. Wow. You don't know tomorrow. Beloved, please. Some of you right now, you're going, yeah, pastor. I'm in the middle of that trouble right now. You borrowed money on speculation. You borrowed money to do business and then COVID-19 hit. And man, there's just nothing happened the way it was supposed to happen. Nothing continued to work the way it was working. Now, beloved, God is a God of grace and God is a God of mercy. I've been there. I've lived that. As a church, we are living proof of the grace of God, that we survived 52% interest rates back in the, in the 1980s and 90s, that we, we survived the pace of devaluing from 3 to 1 to 6 to 1 to 18 to 24 to 48 to 50 plus. I mean, that, that, that we survived those days in debt. I mean, please, I, I look around in this crisis that I go, Lord, this isn't too hard. I mean, during the economic crisis of the 80s and 90s that went on for decades, we, we were in debt, trying to finish a building at the same time, in the middle of a financial crisis. Now, we have no debt. This is not that hard. We're buying land and, and expanding and purchasing land for branch churches. And, oh, this, this is almost a little bit fun. So please, I, I stand before you as a, as a testimony of the grace of God, as an object of his mercy. And I, I'm not going to get into the next. I'll work on the rest of this on Monday night when we talk about, you know, how to, how to pay your debts, because I really want to take time with this. Borrowing for speculation is just wrong. Now, a big ticket item like a house, a big ticket item like a piece of land, okay, that you're going to use and live in, but, but speculation, no. Let me just give you a few practical things here. Number one, never borrow money for operations, for normal expenses. Operations is normal expenses. Never sell assets to pay normal expenses and never go in debt to pay normal expenses. Cut the expenses. Now, now guys, please listen to me carefully on that one. When you, when you start selling assets to pay expenses, when you start borrowing money to pay expenses, you, you are in major, major catastrophic trouble. Okay, you, you just, you have to learn, cut the expenses, all right? Another little practical thing that I've learned in my life, make the payments to yourself first. Halimbawa, we built the building at South Campus debt-free, and everybody knows that. God was good to us. God was gracious to us. Everything was built debt-free, but we borrowed money for the land, and we told everybody that. And we told everybody how we were doing it. We used to rent at Bellevue for about $1.4 million per month as our rental for using it on Sundays. So one day a week, four weeks, it's about $1.4 million a month. We borrowed the money to buy our land at South Campus. Of course, we had down payments we had to put down, but we borrowed our money so that we, again, had about the same payment. So it's no additional cash out. So we're all, we've been making the payments on a regular basis for several years already, only it was as an expense. Now, rather than being an expense, it's mostly building equity and a very small portion of expense called interest. Ah, now think about that. See, some of you are renting right now, and you're renting at $25,000 a month. Well, that's all expense. Now, if you borrowed money, and maybe you had to pay 30000 pesos a month, yes, you've got a little bit more cash out, but how much of that is interest, a small portion? How much of that is building equity? That's almost like saving money. Is putting money in the bank for yourself. So now our property at South Campus is fully paid for. In fact, we paid it off about two years early. It's fully paid for. We got the titles back not too long ago. 
Our property is fully paid for, and the, the appraisal value has gone way up. So instead of $168 million, it's now worth a billion pesos. And we can build a future for the congregation there. You know, we're looking at expanding the current auditorium. We're going to build more educational rooms, more offices. Eventually, we'll build a four or 5,000-seat auditorium where the parking lot is now. But we can build a future because we didn't consume it, the money as an expense. We so okay, instead of $1.4 million a month as rental, we're going to do a piece of that as interest, and the rest of that will be paying equity into ourselves. But we, we knew we could already make the payment. Now, again, you're not speculating on, well, if we grow, we can make the payment. No. Can you do it now? A man said, Pastor Summerall, I want to talk to you about buying a car. I said, fine. And he said, you know, the car is going to cost me this much money per month, and I think I can earn this much on Uber. I said, you can't count on Uber. I said, you can't count on, on business every day, you, you know, and please forgive me. A lot of Uber has been shut down during this economic crisis. How many guys lost their, their Uber or Grab, whichever one it is now? How many guys lost the cars that they purchased for that business? And then because of the COVID-19, it was shut down. I said, if you can't make the payment now, just with what's going on right now, if you don't have the cash to make it now, everything after that is speculation, and you can't count on tomorrow. Now, brothers and sisters, learning and understanding debt is important. Please, as much as possible, stay out of debt. Now, it's better to go into short-term debt to buy a house, get it paid for in 10 years, and then all your cash is yours. Then to rent a house for 30 years and have nothing to leave to your children. Ah, ah, yeah. So short-term debt to build equity, knowing that you can make the payments, okay. But the trick is let no debt remain outstanding. Can you make the payment every month already? Not what you hope to accomplish, not if you get a promotion, not if you do this, not if you do that, not if you put a Saudi star, a Saudi star store in front, and you can make this much money from the Saudi Saudi store every month. Not hope, 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 hope. But right now, can you make the payment out of your current cash flow so that no debt will remain outstanding? Now, I'm going to stop there tonight. Monday night, I'm going to begin to teach you how to pay your debts. And we're going to just take time with this because, forgive me, this is where so many of you are living right now. And, and I know it's not pleasant to talk about these things, but folks, please, we've all made mistakes in these areas. And God is a God of grace and God is a God of mercy. And God is going to help you get this situation turned around. Amen. Let me pray for you tonight. Father, so many are under so much pressure right now. And yes, Lord, they made mistakes. They made wrong decisions. But Father, we don't ask for justice. We ask for mercy. We ask for grace. Father, in the name of Jesus, turn these situations around. Bless the work of their hands, Father, so that no debt will remain outstanding, so that everything can be updated. I thank you for it, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Morning devotions, 545. We start Daniel's prayer. And then morning devotions at 6. I'll see you then. Thank you for going online for tonight's evening service. We hope that you will join Pastors David and Beverly Somerall of the Cathedral of Praise Manila again on Monday at 7 p.m. You may also join our daily devotions with Pastor David E. Somerall every Monday to Saturday at 6 a.m. For more information and updates, visit us on facebook.com slash cop.manila.